Hey, what's up, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Everything You Love. I'm Rob Arnold, and here we are at episode 23. I know it's been a while, so I figured let's get in here and answer some of your guys' great questions. I get a ton of questions, which I'm so thankful for, across YouTube and the comments and across all the socials and everything. And uh, I want you to know, I see all those questions. And every time I come across one, that I think it'd be, you know, just relevant to the community here and that would interest and entertain or inform people, then I take a little screenshot of it, put in a little folder for a time like this when I revisit those questions. So not every one of those questions that you guys ask get moved into that folder because some of them are just kind of spe too specific or, you know, some dude just has a little problem with his guitar that he's asking about. And, I, you know, I know a lot of people aren't interested in that. So I'll just answer it directly right there. Um, so anyways, just kind of letting you know how I do things. I wanted you to know that I see everybody's questions and comments. I appreciate all the interaction, all the love, all the positivity on the channel. So thank you guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you to everybody who's been watching for a long time. To everybody that's new to the channel, welcome. So uh, yeah, just want to let you know how I roll with that. If you got any questions, ask them in the comments and perhaps they'll make it to a show. 24, 25, who knows how long we'll make it. Anyways, let's get warmed up and answer some questions with a question about warming up. Eminem Randall asks, speaking of guitars and playing, do you ever have time to practice or is doing playthroughs your practice? Also, any good warm up tips? So I guess I'd say I don't practice as nearly as much as I'd like to. I really only like practice if I have something specific I need to practice for, like if I'm gonna record a song or like a solo or just something specific that I need to work on, then of course I'll hunker down and, and practice that so I can perfect it before I record. But in terms of just like practicing scales or things like that, I really, I just kind of don't do that anymore. Um, like I said, I wish I, I did a little more. Like there's certain things I've always wanted to learn. I've always wanted to learn country guitar, how to pick like that. I want to learn how to sweet pick, stuff like that. And I always say, I'm going to sit down and practice that stuff, but it just never works out. I never have the time. So no, I don't, I don't really practice much anymore. And just all my playing is kind of practicing. I think, you know, all the playing that I do just for different things. In terms of warming up, um, don't have any like just like exercises or anything that I do when I warm up. I warm up before playing every time, but what I do is, is I just kind of start playing. I won't start playing the stuff I'm specifically going to be recording or working on or whatever. I just start noodling, you know, just playing around and loosen it up like you would with anything. You know, you're gonna, I don't know, do some sports or whatever. Maybe you'll jump some rope, get the blood flowing, just loosen up or whatever. So that's exactly what I'll do. Just grab the guitar. <laughs> Start playing around, loosen it up. I'm not warmed up at all right now. And I don't know, it sounded, probably sounded pretty good, but uh, it's, I'll just do that for a while. And then when it's time to record, because I'm loosened up and the blood is flowing, that picking will be tighter. The chords will be a little bit smoother. The bends will be a little more in pitch and everything, just because your fingers are kind of warmed up and stuff. So that's what I recommend. Just start jamming, uh, just warm it up, you know, like that, but nothing really specific. Good question. Oh. And actually, before we get into the next question, there's something that I want to talk about real quick and maybe some advice some of you guys can give me here. So today, I actually had a different video slated. I wasn't going to do an Everything You Love today. I had an Everything You Love in mind, but um, it was kind of later down the line. I was actually going to talk about this crate amp here. And, um, you know, people have been, you guys have seen that show up lately and a lot of dudes have been commenting on it because it's kind of cool. I think that Crate just has this nostalgia about it, and I think of Megadeth. I think of the Countdown to Extinction era, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. And, uh, you know, they were playing Crates on that cycle. So you'd see in the videos, so you'd see in the live concert footage, you'd see them in the magazines, and there was this aura about, to me, like metal in that time and everything, because I, I was a kid, and, you know, just all the ads in the magazines, you'd see these crates, and so I wanted one. So I was probably like 14, 15 years old, wanted my first half stack, saw one at a music shop, this exact one, a G1600 XL. And um, so I mowed some extra lawns, you know, got the money, I think it was like 450 bucks, got this, this uh, half stack, played it all through high school, and then 
When I joined Camaro when I was 19, uh, after a couple months in the band, you know, needed a kind of a different sound. And um, so took it up to the Guitar Center, traded it in and got this Marshall Valve State half stack. So didn't have the crate anymore. But a couple years ago, I saw one pop up on eBay and hey, I, I just went ahead and bought it. And uh, you know, just, just for fun. I got it, I plugged it in, I played some Megadeth riffs and stuff like that. And that's what I had planned. I had planned to make a video about this amp and do a bunch of Countdown to Extinction riffs and just kind of replicate that sound and talk about it and everything like that. So anyways, go to get started yesterday. Oh, so I just played it for a little bit when I first got the amp cool, whatever, haven't touched it since. Set it up here, again, hadn't touched it, hadn't even jammed through it, just had been planning to, was gonna make this video. And I go to turn the thing on, and it's dead. The power, the power doesn't come on there. Uh, there's one light here for the channel select, but I'm hitting it and it isn't switching. So no main power there, no channel switch, and just no sound through it. So it's totally dead. So any of my tech guys out there, where should I start? You know, like, I don't know much about, about amps or fixing them or, you know, I don't know much about fixing amps. And um, so I don't even really know like where to start, what I should do, what I should look for. So if you got any advice, I'm all ears because I'd still like to make that crate video for anybody that's interested. Next question from Mechanization. Hi Rob, question for an EYL. What other music genres besides metal are you into? Can you point to a Kamira song you wrote that was directly inspired or influenced by something other than your metal roots? If so, please share. Thanks for all the Patreon content. Cheers, bro. Mechanization is one of my patrons. Thank you guys so much. You guys helped make this all happen for me. So I do have a specific song in mind that was inspired by a different genre. That other genre is hip hop. Uh, I like a lot of classic rock. Uh, I love. And, and I love hip hop, mainly just like late 90s or 90s, um, early 2000s, like West Coast, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, West Side Connection. I absolutely love. Uh, so anyways, in 2006, Snoop Dogg dropped his Blue Carpet Treatment album. And there's a bunch of great songs on that. I was jamming it a lot. Me and Jim would jam that a lot in hotel rooms and stuff, just hanging out. Um, and I got inspired by this one song called uh, That's the Shit. <laughs> and it has this, this little like kind of clean, kind of chill intro that's real short. I don't even know that it's worth you guys going and checking it out to see if you can see the resemblance uh, between these two. But that little intro inspired No Reason to Live from Kamira's 2007 Resurrection album. It was all just from one chord. In the uh, Snoop Dogg song, there's this chord that's like this. It's kind of like, it's just one chord, it happens in there. Super pretty, I always liked it. it. Just happens once, but I like that arpeggiated, just like nice chord. And so that's no reason to live. So I kind of just changed it up, put my own little lead over it. And um, I put that song together arranged the whole thing, brought it to the guys. We started working on it right away, early in the resurrection writing cycle. Um, and it became one of the first songs that we worked on and wrote, one of the first songs we recorded. And so, yeah, if you like that one, thank the dog father. Next question is from Brian Smith. Hey Rob, possible question for another video. Do you have any guilty pleasure bands slash artists that you secretly enjoy listening to? Yeah, so a little bit like the, uh, like the last question, but this, well, yeah, this does inspire songs, but nothing specific, but it's Christina Aguilera and primarily the Stripped album, which came out maybe like 2002 or three, somewhere in there. But anyways, I got hooked on that album. There's like, there's like three tunes, um, you know, maybe one or two were a video or just that I got into from listening to the album, Infatuation impossible and um, a tune called Beautiful. I think Beautiful was like all over the radio and, and stuff like that. Anyways, man, did I fall in love with Christina Aguilera and just her note choices, her cadence, her just 
the flow of, of how she sang. And my the way I like to solo is I like to kind of like sing with the notes. And a lot of that is totally inspired by the way Christina Aguilera sings and how she chooses to dance over the chords and the, the melodies and things like that. And she'll just really reach for, for big notes. And I try to reach for big notes, you know, with just big bends and things like that. And um, man, so that, that, that album and her singing just sunk in for me big time and definitely plays a huge part in uh, you know my soloing style and how I like to do things. So I could jam some Christina all day. I remember when, when she first hit the scene way earlier back, Genie in a Bottle, everybody's gotta know that one, but Andals was obsessed with her too. So it's cool. We, if you guys could picture this, me and Andals would sit in the back of the bus sometimes and just jam some Christina Aguilera. I bet uh, nobody knew that, huh? Keith Davies, what's up, Keith? Nice video as always. Thank you, Keith. Always fun to hear your answers to the many questions you get. Thanks again for answering one of mine. Much appreciated. Hey, no problem, Keith. I have another one for you. If you could pick one band to be a member of, can't include any that you've already been a part of, whose band would you choose to be in? Easy. Metallica, of course, my favorite band. Um, you know, Megadeth comes to mind as well. Sepultura, um, I'd love to jam, you know, the early Sepultura stuff. Um, but Megadeth, you know, I mean, that'd be tougher. I can't play all those solos. Having to play all those Marty solos and stuff like that would just be insane. And it's something I could just never really tackle where Hammett is just kind of like more right up my alley. It's what I gravitated towards most and wh what I wanted to learn while I was developing my soloing style. And so I know I could go in there and, and kill those tunes. Um, not that the spot's open or whatever, but just, just imagine that, you know, the, well, first, I, th this is the other thing I wanted to say though, what kind of makes it weird. If I were to get the call today, of course I'd accept you know but the bummer is is that i only like the first five albums from metallica and megadeth and sepultura you know just i never paid attention really after that i, I stopped paying attention to sepultura after that really but but from megadeth and metallica i tried to get into that later stuff there's some stuff from load and reload uh that i like but pretty much so that'd kind of be a bummer just playing all those tunes that i don't really like but of course i would still do it in a heartbeat imagine that experience you know you know the paycheck come on uh so if I got a call today, oh yeah, you know, Hammett left the band or, um, you know, we had to let him go. You know, we heard you, you, you've you been a big fan of the band for a long time. Would you like to come and try out? You better believe I'd be on the next flight out. Here we got one from Scotty Johnston. Hope 2021 is a great year for you, my man. I was wondering, can you name a song on each Chimera album that you feel didn't get enough attention or credit, whether it being be playing it live or album position or just generally underrated. It came to me after listening to a couple of albums in one go. So yeah, I'll kind of just go in order here. Um, this is kind of weird. I don't know exactly know how to describe it. I don't know if like underrated is, is the right word for, for some of these, but Pass Out of Existence, I'm gonna go with this song, Options. And, and I say that because it's one that I don't think we've ever played live and I don't think it's a popular track or anything, but when, after we had recorded the album, Mark and I stayed in California for the mixing of the record. And I think maybe Options is one of the first tunes we did, we, we had mixed or whatever. But when we got that back and you're hearing it back for the first time after jamming it in the rehearsal spot for months uh, and then hearing it recorded and any band that's recorded knows what I mean. When you first hear the songs that you, you've you been working on just in the, the rehearsal spot, like actually recorded professionally and stuff like that, it's, it's the best to hear that because they just sound so good. Anyways, we got options and Mark and I were basically like, dude, this is it. We are going to be huge. This song is going to just go straight to the top. You know, the sky's the limit. Hell yeah. Anyways, you know, all of a sudden after that, the song just became like the butt of our inside jokes. And it's one we kind of just laugh at and make fun of uh, because it's kind of just like a, a black sheep, you know, of, of our catalog of the album and stuff. Again, I don't think we ever played it live, but it's just funny sometimes how that works. We thought it was going to be the biggest tune and then we, it just got totally abandoned and now it's, you know, m made fun of by us and stuff. So that's kind of weird. So uh, impossibility of reason. I'm going to go with The Impossibility of Reason, which is one of my favorite cuts from the record, but it's one we kind of really didn't pay a lot of attention to. I know we've played it a lot live, um, but, and, and, and I'll get into this too. A lot of the time, it's the band and their live performances and what they choose to put in their set lists that makes the songs popular. Like, had we played The Impossibility of Reason every single night, like we did with Power Trip and Pure Hatred, perhaps it would have been just as popular. Um, you know, like on Kill 'Em All, if, uh, you know, if 
Metallica had chosen not to play Seek and Destroy every night and instead did Phantom Lord every night or something like that, Phantom Lord would probably be a staple in their set that people expect to hear and love to hear. So, like I said, it's, it's kind of what the band pushes. So maybe we just didn't push that one, but that's that's kind of like, I guess I would say, an underrated track. You don't hear a lot of people talking about The Impossibility of Reason, the title track. And it's a title track for a reason, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure Mark decided to make that the title track because the thought it jammed, you know, during, while, and after we recorded it. So, um, yeah. Self-titled record. Uh, maybe maybe comatose. It's one we played a lot live as well, but it's just another one of my favorites that that we kind of like like abandon. I don't know why. I mean, it's a workout. You know, it's it's a heck of a song from start to finish. Just pretty relentless. One that um, you know I'm super proud of. That I bet people don't think of right away when they think of the self-titled. You know, they think of Nothing Remains or Save Ourselves, Salvation, stuff like that, which is cool. Whatever though. Um, Resurrection, definitely end it all. That was one of the first cuts written for the record. Definitely one of my favorites. Got a lot of insane picking. I just absolutely love that song, but it's one we've never played live. Another one we just totally abandoned, and I don't really know why. So I would call that an underrated cut, in my opinion. If you don't know that one, go check that out. End it all off our Resurrection album. The Infection. Let's see here. Frozen in Time. That's one. A lot of you guys have heard. Mark and I wrote the majority of The Infection just while we were on tour in the back of the bus. We'd get off stage and just go back there and start writing. And I remember having that feeling about Frozen in Time, where we thought it was gonna be a big cut. You know, that, uh, just that riff. So, I just, I had, I had even pictured it. I told Mark, you know, from the get-go, I want that to be track two, you know, just so track one ends. That's that, uh, Venom inside. Just wanted that to hit, you know? And that's another one we just never really played live. I know we did maybe once, maybe twice. MySpace Secret Show, maybe. Who's got that poster out there? Um, so, yeah, I'll go with that one. Frozen in Time. Um, and then The Age of Hell. Probably Scapegoat. I think a lot of these I'm just naming my favorite songs from, from the album, or if, if they didn't you know, get to the stages or whatever. So uh, I don't think we ever played Scapegoat Live. Um, you know, it just doesn't really get a lot of love, but I gave it some love. For those of you that saw, you know what I'm talking about. If not, go check this out. In Everything You Love, episode 21, uh, I start the video just with a little rendition. Just a, I play maybe like a minute of the tune at the beginning. Um, it's pretty cool. And then Mark and I go on to talk about The Age of Hell and the vinyl release of all that and a lot about the recording process and all that. So if you want to know more about The Age of Hell and stuff like that, make sure you check out episode 21 or if you want to see me play a little Scapegoat. So yeah, that's it. Uh, those are all the Chimera records I was a part of. Present Darkness? I don't know, whatever. Another one here from Pierre Gutierrez. What's up, Pierre? Great video, Rob. I got a question for everything you love. Since you are a big Metallica and Six Feet Under fan, what do you think about the Freight Ends of Sanity cover by Six Feet Under? Did you get to play it live? Thanks, man, and cheers. Cheers, Pierre. Um, and I love it. I love all the Six Feet Under covers. They're, they're awesome. Those Graveyard Classics records, you know, they're just, they're just funny. You know, it's just funny to hear uh, Barnes, Chris Barnes singing those songs, ACDC songs. And I mean, it's just funny, but they're still awesome. They're really well done. You know, they all, they all sound great. And I've always loved uh, Chris's covers back from when I heard um, Zero the Hero, which is like a Black Sabbath cover from their like Hammer Smash Face like single or B-side, some some just CD that I just had a couple like live tracks, Hammer Smash Face and the song Zero the Hero. And at the time as a kid, I didn't know it wasn't a Cannibal Corpse song. It was years later that I found out that it was Black Sabbath, but I loved that. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just awesome hearing, uh, hearing those songs in a super, portrayed in a super death metal way, you know? So, um, but no, didn't get to play The Freight Ends of Sanity live. Um, we did do a couple, well, they were all covers to me when I was playing with Six Feet Under, um, you know, but, but we did a couple Cannibal tunes. So, you know, those were also covers for me, but obviously not for Chris. So, but, ah, man, come on, that was awesome. Talk about a dream come true as I'm playing, you know, cuts from Tomb of the Mutilated and the Bleeding with Chris Barnes on stage night after night. Those are what dreams are made of. So on that note, 
we're gonna wrap up this episode. If you've made it this far, I appreciate it. Give the video a thumbs up for me. If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you can know every time I drop a new video. If you have the means, please check out my Patreon campaign where it's a behind the scenes community where dudes are seeing some behind the scenes stuff. You know, um, I got drum tracks and tablature and stuff on there, just kind of exclusive, you know, just more more one-on-one -on -one chats, all that. So you can check that out at patreon.com slash Rob Arnold World if you're interested in supporting the channel and getting involved. I got my guitar instructional DVD available if you want to learn some guitar from me. And uh, my Tone Crate Kemper profile pack with all the classic Chimera tones, plus t-shirts, CDs, everything like that in the Rob Arnold World store, robarnoldworld.com slash store. So check that out if you'd like to. Again, appreciate everybody watching, everybody getting involved. Thank you guys so much. It's a big help. And I really enjoy doing this for you guys. So I'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers.